I V M. Going for parties is just so frustrating these days. I mean, your mom will make it a point to come and tell you how her friend's son has secured a house for her, and your wife will also find out that her sister's husband is taking her on a foreign holiday. While you're wondering why you're the only one who doesn't have a plan for the damn future, that's why I never sleep well during the festive time. Unless hmm, www.hdfclife.com select select done. You know what? I think I'll sleep rather well after all. Live calm with HDFC Life Click to protect life. The Income Plus option offers life cover and steady income stream, so you're always ready for any expenses that life throws at you. Basically, this plan lets you plan your expenses like you plan your vacations. It's that simple. Visit hdfclife.com to know more and for terms and conditions. to a brand new episode of the Musafir Stories India's very own travel podcast where each week we share the journey of travelers in their own words and relive their experiences with you our listeners Hello everyone welcome to a very very special episode of the Musafir Stories We are celebrating 5 years of the podcast this month The Musafir Stories is a labor of love and wouldn't have been possible without our wonderful guests and of course you our listeners who have been a part of our journey over these years. Thank you so much for all your support and love that has kept us going. On the podcast today we speak to Yunus Lasania a journalist and a heritage expert who takes us on a walk around the remarkable old city of Hyderabad as part of the episode and of course our 5th year anniversary we are giving away 5 tickets to Yunus's heritage walk all you have to do is listen to the episode and answer three very simple questions good luck and on with today's episode You're the people pleaser, right? Oh, yes. Or then desperately seeking the one? Oh wait, you're the one who doesn't think they're ever good enough. Oh. So much drama, and for what? Is it doing you any good? <laughs> Listen to me. I'm Chetna, your favorite positive action coach. Yes, I'm the one who has been dropping all those truth bombs on every episode. I know. And it's time you learn to say no to drama. That's also what my podcast is called, and a new episode is out. Every Monday and Wednesday on the IBM Podcast app website, as well as all major podcasting platforms. So, with that introduction, we'd love to welcome Yunus Lasania, a journalist, heritage expert, oral historian, host of the podcast Beyond Char Minar, and also a curator of the Hyderabad History Project. Yunus, thank you so much for being on the podcast, and uh, quite a bio to have. Uh, running out of. Uh, breath now to fit everything into in one go thank you so much yeah i mean yeah of course I'm, i i am primarily uh, most for most parts a journalist because i i do so most of it has to do with my love for writing i am a writer primarily uh-huh. uh but yeah everything else comes afterwards yeah thank you and uh, sure through your um, uh, intro people would have uh, realized that you have a heavy heavy connection to hyderabad and hyderabad's history right uh, both right. through your podcast the hyderabad history project that you curate on instagram as well as um, obviously the works you do which we'll discuss a little bit more about today uh, but uh, tell us a little bit more about when all of this started so for for those of you who are maybe listening and who are not aware of hyderabad history uh in general so the last ruler or the last monarch of hyderabad had his 50th death anniversary uh in 2017 february 24th if i'm not wrong at that point of time i was working as a reporter with the hindu and i i was starting to cover a lot of uh, history stuff heritage and stuff you know and that, so apparently there's a small thing that happens every year at his grave which is not surprising but then i you know i i, I was like you know maybe we can do something else and that's when uh i just met a couple of people who knew him and wrote us like wrote like a, i wrote an, uh, i actually pitched that idea for the hindu sunday edition which was then just launched 
so uh, after i wrote that article it kind of went like i wouldn't say went viral like in today's terms mm-hmm. like you know how you know when we say that something goes mm-hmm. viral it's like literally at every at every single place and across all over google right yeah. but uh, it was very well received is what i would say like i got a whole bunch of emails from couple of forms from the us i got some emails from delhi about this and that some i remember some family member also emailing me mm-hmm. bunch of my own family members also read that article i wrote and then i realized okay so clearly people are interested in this kind of stuff but nobody is writing things that need to be written so that is what so that 2017 2017 march incidentally the same year nearly the same time someone introduced me to a forum and told them i can you know since i have a lot of information on hyderabad i might be able to conduct walks so incidentally the first walk i did at that point of time was a food walk and not actually a history walk mm-hmm. i didn't i didn't even know about what the badshah ya shur khana was that was like the first time and then i did another walk uh, another month later and the thing is i was also pretty much still learning about hyderabad at that point of time right. so i think by 2017 ending is when i started kind of i thought you know i should do something like you know something seriously so yeah so that's just that's just how it started i just started very randomly writing about and also it it made me kind of connect with my own city you know it took me what i guess 26 years of my life to learn about my own city <laughs> so then you know i i thought people should also know about hyderabad the way i am learning about hyderabad and you know history like in in schools when we learn history it's very boring it's all just dates and this and that so then i thought you know uh, you know i thought i should, I should probably connect every day buildings or every day objects that people see to their lives that way it would make more sense yeah definitely and uh, i think this is something about the local history as well right that uh, i mean uh, obviously you living in um, in hyderabad would still be exposed to some amount of it in your uh, curriculum and all of that but people outside of it it's even lesser right people in a different state no they... actually the thing is i i don't remember reading anything about hyderabad right. history books <laughs> yeah so so so, so, so yeah, that was a problem you know like a inter andhra telangana issue that was there I think that's now been rectified. Where Hyderabad history, Telangana history is there in our books, and I, I, I think it's a very Indian problem in that sense. It's not necessarily about Hyderabad. Right. People mostly grow up detached about their own city history, and uh, they basically have no sense of belonging. Yeah. So, which I do have now. So, I think in that sense, most of my work has always been to just you know help people connect uh, with their own cities. That's it. Yeah, no, especially with the uh, rote learning type of format in schools and academics as well. You're very much, like I said, focusing on names and uh, dates more yeah, than learning exactly. about the stories, right? So, uh, it's very boring. Yeah, it gets very boring, and yeah, you miss out on a lot of the good stuff, right? All the juice the, in the stories, you miss out on all of that. So, I think walks like these are a great way of. Um, discovering that local history so thank you so much for uh, sharing that with us you know and uh, about today's uh, topic of discussion as well right we wanted to um, like turn the focus a little bit on uh, one of the walks you do and uh, especially i was very keen on the old city walk because that's really the heart of the old hyderabad city as well right uh, uh, can you tell us a little bit more about the walk itself where it starts and uh, a little bit about the old city too like where exactly is so, this so you know the, the thing is a uh, lot of people don't actually realize that when we talk about the old city mm-hmm. we only talk about you know it's i i understand this whole uh, thing about cities having older areas and stuff but what is funny is hyderabad's old city actually isn't the oldest part of the city mm-hmm. it is the golconda fort right fort was established as the as a city in the year 1518 as the capital of the golconda kingdom So Hyderabad was built much later in 1591 by the Qutub Shah or the Golconda kings. So mm-hmm. there's like a 70 something year gap between the fort and the city. So what I'm trying to say is that Hyderabad essentially used to be a new city to the Golconda fort. So it's a little bit of a misnomer, yeah. Yeah. So I mean, of course. So the thing is, people people do go to the Golconda fort as well. They just don't realize that the fort predates it mm-hmm. by that extent. But the thing is, the old city was meant to be like this major, new, gorgeously built city, which had everything, and it was that. And so the the, the so the thing is, I just whoever is listening, so the, the, the Hyderabad was founded in 1591 by Muhammad Kuli Qutub Shah, the fourth king of the Golconda Kingdom. Mm-hmm. Uh, the Golconda Kingdom is uh, the dynasty that uh, built the Golconda Fort, obviously. The fort was 
essentially a proper wall city which is about roughly 7 km in circumference the boundary walls of the golconda fort still exist uh, the fort was not enough for people to live in which is why after a point the kings decided to move out mm-hmm. and that is why hyderabad was built by mohammad kulik putra so when the city was built it was not just a charminar you have a whole you had a whole bunch of for that time you had like a whole bunch of modern institutions that were constructed like even the like even a hospital called the darul shifa darul shifa stands for house of healing i believe mm-hmm. or you have darul shifa you have the badshah hai ashur khana for those of you who don't know what this is about an ashur khana is where shia muslims mourn the death of the prophet muhammad's grandson imam hussein every year uh, uh, and the you have the ashur khana and you had like a whole bunch of buildings that were constructed so the thing is about the old city we actually don't know how hyderabad used to look originally because the entire city was raised to the ground in the year 1687 by the mughal king aurangzeb mm-hmm. so the mughals actually conquered hyderabad in 1687 and they destroyed the entire city to the point where there's actually nothing much left from the original city the charminar of course then is still intact the charminar the badshah ashur khan the makam masjid the golconda fort the qutub shahi tombs and maybe there are about 40 50 buildings left from the original city i guess mm-hmm. not more than that or maybe i could be wrong but what i'm trying to say is that there aren't a lot of things remaining from the king from the city's original foundation just for context the nizams of hyderabad who come much later the nizams are actually uh, soldiers or sorry commanders on working under the mughals mm-hmm. so essentially they were part of the mughal armies that destroyed hyderabad in 1687 right, right. it's a very common uh, thing across the world where you have a governor uh, where you have a soldier becoming a general and then from a general becoming a governor and then becoming a king so it's not a very unheard of trajectory it's a very common trajectory you know for all we know after hyderabad was destroyed any other commander could have become the nizam of hyderabad but it was fate eventually that chose the nizams and these are the asaf shahis right yeah the asaf shahis yeah so the, mm-hmm. so so there's, so there's a gap of some 30 something years from 1687 when hyderabad is destroyed up to 1724 uh, you have the first nizam who does take control for a bit but then you have other governors as well and these, these governors are ruling from aurangabad and maharashtra and not from hyderabad because they don't have just hyderabad and the golconda empire they have pretty much about roughly one third of south india mm-hmm. sorry they have one third one third of of india which includes major parts of central and south india mm-hmm. so that's what the areas of the nizam were in, at least under in the 1700s initially so it is the second nizam which who decides to move back to hyderabad and shift his capital from aurangabad to hyderabad so when we go to the old city today so most of hyderabad's institutions and monuments that we have are, are actually things that date back to the 20 early 20th and to the mid 20th century essentially under the last nizam Mm-hmm. So what you have are mostly buildings built by the last Nizam in his effort to modernize Hyderabad. So when we do the old city walk, it's a mix of the oldest foundation monument and some modern structures in that sense. So so you know for a very basic introductory walk, I have come to realize that it's very confusing for a lot of people. Sure. So to make it interesting, you know, I have to stick to some interesting stories and some interesting facts. Can't just give them dates because that's yeah. when history gets very boring, right? Yeah. so context is always important so that's why when we do the old city or history walk ideally speaking i should be walking from the charminar to the badshah ashur khana because the ashur khana was built in 1593 two years after the charminar mm. uh, but the charminar does not open till 9 mm-hmm. uh, and the ashur khana luckily is open from like from super early in the morning so what we do is we go to the ashur khana we explore the ashur khana early morning is pretty calm and there's no not much traffic so we maybe we have to stop for breakfast and then we walk to the charminar by 9 mm-hmm. in between that walk from the ashur khana to the charminar you have a bunch of institutions also so i try to like include whatever there is in between so, so but the ashur khana and charminar we cover mm-hmm. uh, there is breakfast and there is chai in between so most of the time it's a good start to the day and i end the walk at the charminar where i you know go into the physical aspects and you know how i like i try to at least mentally give a picture of maybe how the city once used to be Right. and that's that i do i don't go into the second like the modern part of hyderabad under the nizam to the nizam part because obviously the foundations don't have anything to do with the nizams yeah that walk i do separately at the chaumahalla palace or at the museums yeah we could definitely touch upon that uh, towards the end of this and uh, uh, just to kind of go back to some of the call outs right you did mention that there's some interesting stories you know in terms of the 
just the name of the place also right hyderabad uh, do you want to add a little more color as to how that name came into being and also there's uh, obviously uh, other names associated to the place as well like bhagnagar is one of the uh, names that pops oh, up right okay. so if you want to give a quick uh, peek into that so the thing is if you look at hyderabad history the foundation history essentially is there's a legend attached to the city that the founding king mohammad quli qutub shah was in love with a dancer slash commoner by the name bhagmati who lived somewhere in waters in the area what comes to what came to be known as the as hyderabad charnar eventually mm-hmm. but uh, see it's it's a legend there is some evidence on both sides in the sense that there is some there are contemporary sources that mention bhagmati from the 16th century at the same time we don't actually have definite proof that she existed because well because there is no physical evidence like there's no trace of her existence mm-hmm. in that sense so it's it's still disputed history now the story is that mohammad quli qutub shah named the city bagnagar and it was renamed later renamed to hyderabad even as far as that is concerned sure if, if even if there is proof that hyderabad was called bagnagar it is named after bagmati okay what the what the current renaming issue is it has it has nothing to do with bhagmati or mohammad quli qutub shah what they are attaching to it is this uh, unauthorized temple that is built on the charminar mm-hmm. uh, the temple is not very old there are several photos of the charminar without the temple even going back to some decades ago so there's mm-hmm. this, this this is not like a ram janmabhoomi temple issue where somebody is claiming that charminar was built on it to insult somebody nothing like that charminar was pretty much simply built to mark hyderabad foundation in 1991 when this new city was built mm-hmm. that's about it there is no the, there are definitely temples older than hyderabad itself somewhere around in these areas but the temple on the charminar is even archaeologically very obvious and very clear that it's a cement structure mm-hmm. so if you call yourself a historian or, or an architect or anything it's just going to be You know, nobody is going to take it seriously if you ever say that the temple existed before the Charminar. More importantly, it is uh, dangerous to the monument and to people because it's a cement structure that is attached to a structure made built with lime mortar, and right. if it it could easily collapse at some point, so it's just very dangerous. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. But like to your point, uh, I think the history ties back to one like setting up of this new city, and there's also. Um, Another thing I came across was that this is built just right after the plague, or uh, praying for the plague to end, something on those lines. So, so, right? so, so the plague thing also is not exactly a hundred percent thing. It, it it does correspond with the bubonic plague at mm-hmm. that point of time, but as far as Hyderabad is concerned, there I don't think that uh, it is a hundred percent certain that there was a plague. Mm. The idea to actually construct a new city outside of the Golconda fort was originally Muhammad Quli Qutub Shah's father. Okay, so mm-hmm. it is not it is not a new idea in that sense. Most mostly from what our understanding is that the area where the charminar is today was pretty much chosen because of the av- availability of water, mm-hmm. because Hyderabad was built or I guess was founded on the southern banks of the Musi River right. with the very specific intention of requ- of the requirement of water. So the mm-hmm. plague thing may or may not be true, but uh, the the other issue is what it is. Right. Yeah. So thanks so much for uh, kind of sharing some more light on uh, those other stories. Also, I know some of them there is still a certain amount of dispute. But uh, again, it's good to know the different kinds of legends and folklore that uh, are associated to the names and uh, right. the place as well. Right. And the Hyderabad Mahal, I guess, was the name of the wife of the ruler. I think. Yeah. So the, so the official story says that uh, the city was first. called bhagnagar and after bagmati converted she took on the name of hyder mahal which mm-hmm. it actually does not make sense because mohammad quli qutub shah's own mother was a hindu so mm-hmm. if if at all he married to a, 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 a non muslim woman her converting to islam i mean i guess you could say maybe she did but i don't think that would have been necessary given their history Okay. So that's what I believe. Of. That's why I said it's disputed history, right? So I, I always tell people they can believe in anything that they want to. <laughs> yeah, sure. Uh, no, but thanks so much for calling that out. And uh, just going back to uh, like where you begin the walk as well, right? Uh, right. You know, so you mentioned that you start this as the 
at the Badshahi Ashur Khan are right? yeah, do you want to call out right. a little bit about that like in terms of the structure what it is and also primarily like a Shia Muslim monument or place of uh, mourning like you said right that's what these uh, Ashur Khanas are uh, can you yeah. share some more uh, light and detail about that too please so, yeah, so for those of you who are not aware Shia Muslims are essentially followers of uh, Pro- the Prophet Muhammad's son-in-law and cousin Imam Ali so the Badshah Ashur Khan is a very specifically Shia Muslim monument and the Charnar in fact also has a whole bunch of Shia Islamic uh, influences in that sense so do a lot of the foundational monuments because obviously they were Shia Muslims but there is there are a lot of local Telugu Hindu influences as well which is a very common Indian thing to do by most of our kings they they mix it you know the architecture everything is a proper confluence it's not necessarily a mix or anything so it's just you know they are kings who had some persian sensibility but they were pretty much in that sense hyderabadi or from the state from telangana they called themselves sons of telangana so the badshah ashur khan was built by mohammad quli qutub shah in 1593 two years after he built hyderabad so going back to what i was saying the followers of the prophet the, the, the followers of imam ali who was the prophet son in law and cousin are shia muslims so essentially you know if you look at islam also after the prophet mohammed death in the 7th century there were there was essentially a an issue of who will become the leader of all the muslims now you know in that sense that's pretty much what i can tell it to people who are not aware of you know the, the intricacies of what happened post the prophet muhammad's life essentially it was a succession issue one of um, one of imam ali's sons imam hussein also gets killed in what is known as the battle of karbala he was essentially he was he was killed along with 72 i think of his followers his death took place on the 10th day of muharram muharram which is the first month of the islamic calendar because he died on the 10th day of muharram which is called ashura shia muslims construct ashur khana the word ashura means 10 so the badshah ashur khana is essentially nothing but a shia muslim place of mourning and the qutub shah is being the qutub shah kings who had a lot of sense with regard to local culture also encouraged local hindus to take care to, to, to participate in the shia traditions which is why muharram is a very mixed tradition as in you'll find a lot of hindus also going to the ashur khana here every year so that monument still pretty much stands as far as i am concerned it is the most important monument in the city after the char minar so that's why that's why i always make sure i take people there no matter what okay i definitely and how far away from the char minar is this maybe 7 minutes by walk okay so fairly close by and yeah definitely uh, even in terms of the architecture right uh, looks like a lot of the persian influences all this and uh, on this as well and very very uh, colorful also right some of the um, internal yeah so you have like you, so you, it pretty much looks very similar to a lot of the uh, architecture well, it yeah you will probably look feel like you're in iran is what i can say or maybe even uzbekistan for that matter mm-hmm. they did use persian tiles uh, mosaic tiles Unfortunately a lot of the tiles have been lost due to damage over the years so but go, good chunks of it are still there okay. so it is still a very beautiful place okay, yeah definitely and and uh, from here you mentioned that uh, usually as you walk you you st- make a stop over for breakfast or chai or breakfast right before you so the uh, thing is i would always stop for a proper hyderabadi breakfast which is keema roti etc things like that no which is, which is mostly non veg mm-hmm. but then there is this thing called govind dosa bandi which is basically a, it's a it's a small push cart which is actually pretty pretty tasty mm. so you know the thing is maybe out of 100% of the people who come sometimes maybe just two three sometimes maybe just one sometimes maybe is five who don't eat meat right. so you know i just need something that's more is easier for me to just so we have now nowadays this hyderabad is now picked up hugely on this concept of cheese dosa which is not just cheese but you will have these i guess it's like a modern hodgepodge of a dosa where basically on the batter you slap on uh, what do you call butter you slap on upma and masala and then some onion and stuff and then you just dump it with a slice of ghee so it's a bit of cheese <laughs> it's like this very neo noir dosa is what i call it So it's very tasty. I mean, of course, dosa purists might not agree that it is dosa. I mean, of course, we can, and that's not a problem with me. But yeah, so that's where we stop for dosa generally. So then we walk. By, so by the time we reach Charnar, by nine or eight forty-five, it opens up. Mm-hmm. So that's what the typical walk is. On the way, we have also have something called the Patthar Gatti Market, which is basically a Nizam era market that was built in the nineteen twenties. Mm-hmm. So if somebody wants to stop there for some 
photos and stuff, we stop there for like a couple of minutes. And the small, small things on the way there that I show people, something like Gulzar House. Gulzar House is now a dirty yellow fountain, but originally that was supposed to be a drinking water fountain built with Hyderabad. The mm-hmm. original structure, of course, does not exist anymore, but whatever exists of it, we see that. Yeah, this is the Gulzar House, H A U S H O U Z. H O U Z essentially yeah. stands for water fountain in Persian. Right, right, right. So yeah, that's one more uh, as a stopover. Definitely something I, that one can check out. Uh, tell us a little bit more about uh, Charmanar as well. Like obviously the most symbolic structure of uh, Hyderabad, right? The most iconic. So the Charmanar is essentially uh, Hyderabad's foundation. That is the first monument built. A 50, I think 160 feet is the height of it, and mm-hmm. uh, it's it's a very interesting monument because when it was built, it was very specifically constructed with the idea to make it a very unique monument in that sense, you know, to, to build something that was not there. And it, it is still very unique in that sense. It is, uh, it's not, so it's not like Delhi's old city, where, like Shah Jahanabad, where you have, you know, for example, in the Jama Masjid, mm-hmm. which is like an extremely congested place. Coming back to the Charmina, you have this monument, which was built very specifically with the idea to uh, make it like the center of the new city. So that is exactly what it is. It, it served as the center of the new city. You had everything that came up around it. it. It has a lot of Shia Muslim motifs and also a lot of floral motifs which you will find only in temples. So mm-hmm. very clearly it's a mix between it's, it's Indo-Persian architecture in that sense. Apparently there was a what, there was a fountain also inside and uh, with an elephant. Mm-hmm. That fountain has apparently been taken away uh, or it was destroyed by Aurangzeb in the last war with the Golconda. So the monument luckily has not been seen any major damage. There's a small mosque, not a mosque, it's actually a mother such. I mean, five, four hundred years ago, I mean, we didn't have the concept of schools and colleges. Basically, it served as a seminary for students. Mm-hmm. Um, outside the Charmina, we have two mosques. Uh, one is called the Makkah Masjid, which is the more famous big one, mm-hmm. as it is larger, everybody knows. But that was built much later. Uh, the original mosque. Of the char, like built when the around when the charmina was built, is this smaller Jama Masjid that is just outside on the left side, completely hidden by a lot of encroachments in the front. Mm-hmm. So that was the mosque built outside the charmina in 18, uh, sorry, 1595, 1596. Mm-hmm. So yeah, so that was exactly. So the charmina, it, 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 it's, it was nothing but like it's like a public square built for the new city, and all of the new things came around it. So that is exactly what it. It's still. I mean, I can't say that anymore that it is, it is the city, because the old city is obviously not the city centre anymore. We have high-tech, so high-tech city now, so high-tech city is... High-tech city is to Hyderabad what Hyderabad used to be to Golconda, for, to put it simply. <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah, I think that uh, that is a proper analogy, I think, right, to, to compare yeah. that to the a new extension of sorts, right, to the existing city yep, or the old exactly, city. Exactly, exactly, yeah. exactly, yeah. And uh, uh, just in terms of the structure as well, you can go up uh, the stairs, right? You can go up to... Uh, yeah, yeah, you can go up to the first level. floor. Yeah, yeah. You can go up, you can but go up I to guess the, the madrasa and all of that, that's probably out of bounds. I'm I right? believe uh, somebody, I believe someone committed suicide a couple of decades ago. Uh-huh. So after that, they shut down the monument for a very long time and they reopened it, but they only allow us to go to the first floor now. Hmm. Okay. Interesting, and uh, these four uh, minarets also, right? The minars, are, uh, like in the name, those are also <clears throat> kind of uh, very symbolic of a lot of these uh, Islamic structures, right? Yeah, I mean, see, the thing is, it's when we say Islamic structure, also, I guess in that sense, we may be probably referring to structures that were built by Muslim kings because I don't think Jarna in that sense was meant to be like a Muslim monument because. It is a proper mixed fusion of Indo-Persian architecture. A, mm-hmm. it was a, it's a, it's a proper. I would say it was a proper secular building constructed by the king, because the apart from the Qutub Shahis and the Persians, the it was the local Telugus who were living in Hyderabad and who pretty much had a very high status right from the beginning. No, that's fair enough. <laughs> no, I think that's fair. Uh, and also tell us a little bit more about uh, <clears throat> the markets around Chaminar as well, right? Uh, because these are also very popular and uh, not just very new also, right? These have um, been around for a long time, uh, right, Yunus? So the thing is, <laughs> the city, one of the main reasons why Hyderabad was built also was because of new ministers, of the necessity to have new markets. Mm-hmm. 
uh, it's like this the main or the, the 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 more famous market is something called the lard bazaar or the chudi bazaar where people this is the bangal market right mm-hmm. and uh, there's a lot of shopping and stuff that happens there so like you know what the history books tell us is that hyderabad used to be this extremely fancy international city where you, it drew a lot of foreigners and stuff at mm-hmm. some point of time and apparently the city was so fancy that it, it also had an exit visa that was mandatory for foreigners to show what they were taking back from here it's not that anymore it's now it's more like a market for pearls pearls is a very recent thing that has come there it's not a very old thing mm. so it's just that so the thing is under the last nizam also to encourage a lot of trade he did bring in a lot of marwadi traders which is why you have some some very old shops there these are shops that sell things like itar and basically on the way to the charminar there is a very old shop which has a board that says that this particular person is allowed to just to set up a fruit stall here by special permission from the nizam so you have these kind of things that exist but as far as the market are concerned it's mostly local shopping or, or and also now there is a modern market for clothes mostly for the weddings and stuff yeah so these are the things that you will find there now yeah as i have told you a lot of our wedding shop there her wedding our, our wedding shopping was done there like she did a lot yeah. of purchasing from there uh, as well uh, but yeah these uh, i mean uh, even in the past again i don't know like how old, like you mentioned right the pearl trading it's, it's like known as the city of the pearls also right uh, refer to it as right. a lot of times and even the diamonds right um, not necessarily from this place but from golconda so the thing is diamonds were mined mostly from one particular place in the golconda kingdom and that is called the kollur area which is on the andhra karnataka border mm-hmm. some books also mention that that is the place from where the coin of diamond was mined mm-hmm. entirely possible but the diamond trading that happened stopped back then itself mm-hmm. okay so it's not something that's happening now the there is a misconception that the golconda fort had diamond mines because uh the diamonds were mined from the kollur area and then it was cut and sold inside the golconda fort so the golconda fort developed a reputation as a diamond market mm-hmm. so that's how the golconda kingdom became famous for diamond trading so mm-hmm. one of the main reasons to move out of the fort and to build a new city also was the fact that they needed new markets for these kind for this kind of stuff as well sure so the diamond trading was there but the diamond mines ran out long ago so it's not there is that market is not there anymore that is because we need to understand that after hyderabad was destroyed in 1687 uh, it became the capital of the deccan once again only in 1765 so 65 75 uh, nearly 70 nearly 8 80 years is when the city was pretty desolate mm-hmm. and destroyed there's like a, we have like old grain markets and mama uh, like you know begum bazaar and stuff but uh, diamond markets no Okay, uh, and uh, just in terms of the other um, structures from, say, the Hutub Shahi period, right? Are there any others that you covered during the work, or these are the primary yeah, ones? Yeah, yeah. So we, so earlier we used to go to the Makkah Masjid also, mm-hmm. uh, but now because of COVID, I think it's been shut for okay. people. Well, there's Guldar House and uh, Guldar House, Char Minar, Bachcha Shur Khan. Of course, there's a Char Kaman. Mm-hmm. So the Char Kaman is just it just comes on the way. So these are essentially you have these four huge arches. that you come across mm-hmm. before reaching the charminar so these arches were built as entrances to the new city of hyderabad when it was built with each serving a different purpose like the the one on the western arch essentially was supposed to be where the original palaces were built the palaces were also destroyed in 1687 and was one side of the arch was essentially the entrance to a market and things like that so those arches are still there luckily and in terms of uh... Like, like like I mentioned, these are mostly the Khutub Shahi monuments, right? Uh, what are the others that are say later during the periods of the Asaf Jahis? What are the other monuments that came up um, that you'd like to call out and are a part of your other works, Yunus? So sometimes, like I said, I do. Sometimes I also combine both those periods. So I do like the Char Minar and Char Mahal Palace, and the other place is the Nizam's Museum, where you have a lot of artifacts from the from the last Nizam's time, mm. which were gifted to him on his completion of. 25 years as a king in 1937. So that the Nizam Museum is a very interesting place. It's a private museum still run by the last Nizam's family. Mm-hmm. Sometimes I also do a, a very alternative, a very alternate walk is what I call it, where mm-hmm. we don't go to all these places. What we do is we kind of walk from the Mosi River from the other side. I try to cover, like for example, near the near the Badshah Ashur Khana, uh, you have something called. Uh, the the government city city college so government city college is what was built uh, 
around 1920s when hyderabad was being modernized so you have that city college and then i cover like we can't enter the high court but we can at least see it from outside and then uh, you have this 19 not at flood where a whole you have a couple of markers on the main road from when the city was flooded in 1908 so we should we try to cover those places it's like a very different uh, walk that i do where we don't actually go to any major monument but we mm-hmm. see the smaller the lesser known things and we end up at the end try to go to a radio service place which has been running since 1948 called the hub radio service mm. okay yeah interesting uh, and uh, just calling out the couple of places you mentioned right the chowmahala uh, palace and yeah, nizam's palace yeah. all of these belong to the asafzai period and more 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 so to the last uh, king right amir usman ali khan uh, right. <laughs> i was really uh, kind of surprised to find out like uh, he at one point of time he was considered to be the richest person in the world right uh, Yeah, yeah, he was. So, 1937 is when I believe, or 1938 is when he appeared on the cover of Time magazine. Um, yeah, so he did. So, so the thing is, under Usman Ali Khan, it's not just, it's not just that they made that he was rich because they they had a great source of income. It's also the fact that a lot of the income was directly through tax collections and farm. You know, it's like you had the Nizams and you had state appointed landlords who were supposed to pay the Nizams. or the government a certain amount of money regularly that was the whole point of the whole revenue of the state depended upon the tax collection from farmers which the the top of the food chain were the nizams and then you had the paigars and then you mm-hmm. had the other nobility and then you had the whole bunch of jagirdars who were essentially revenue collectors like 60% of the entire nizam state which was the largest state in in india among all the princely states 60% of it was essentially uh, revenue lands so you can imagine how much of the how much of revenue was being collected at that point of time it's not surprising that he was made as he became a cultist man at that point of time it, it was essentially a feudal system it was pretty much what but that was the that was the prevalent situation everywhere so i don't want to blame for that so yeah he was the richest man there are a lot of stories about his wealth and uh, how much money he had and very surprisingly is one of those few people who in spite of having a lot of wealth never wasted it people call him a miser that he was a miser but i don't think he was a miser at all i think mm. so misers don't spend on anything but he was somebody who spent on a lot of money on hyderabad to reconstruct right. the city he spent money on the city's infrastructure which not any, a lot of people did with that much interest so i think it's mm-hmm. primarily that he didn't spend it himself and because he didn't look like a typical indian king who had a lot of money in the sense that he was not wasting it upon himself maybe that's why you know you wouldn't expect the king to maybe use his radio twice or thrice in his entire life in his lifetime and you wouldn't yeah, expect yeah he wasn't king... very opulent that yeah, way yeah, exactly, for the show exactly, of it right exactly right? exactly so if you look at his photos post at post hyderabad annex section to india you will find him wearing a very tiny like he he look he look like a very diminutive right. figure with just blue white shalwar kameez or kurta pajama so even 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 if you look at the older class nobility class from hyderabad even those guys dress up even today so compared to that the nizam look very ordinary after the after he mm-hmm. was not the nizam as well so yeah, yeah but, but it's just that like that fact that he was the richest man i, I didn't really know before i started looking into this right. and obviously heard uh, it on your uh, one of your other podcast episodes as well so that was quite uh, interesting to find out uh, and a lot of these other palaces as well right of the this era the falaknuma palace for example is one of the others yeah so the falaknuma palace uh, unfortunately i don't have access to it directly because it's run by the taj group now so you basically need yeah, to spend like <laughs> yeah. some money on it to go there yeah so yeah. i can't do walks there the yeah, other most of the rest of the walks are in other parts of the city like there's one one walk i do mm-hmm. on churches in sikandarabad uh abbot is actually a very interesting nizamira place that has a bunch of monuments like for example there are churches like the saint george's church and there's a church called the saint luke's hindustani church which is a church that was built for muslim converts to christianity mm-hmm. about 100 years ago so where this, the the service still happens in urdu there because of that uh then you have you in an abbot you also have a the theosophical society and you have a zoroastrian fire temple and uh, there's like sarojini naidu's house and then you have the what was earlier the british residency and now called the kingkoti women's college so you have a whole bunch of places in abbot so abbot is where i do a couple of walks 
then you have second ball and then you have the goal so the golconda fort it's not the main fort i do walks in the periphery or the gates of the golconda fort which have massive bastions and other pathways and then we also do walks with the kutubshahi tombs so yeah so it's like a bunch of places in different parts yeah definitely a lot a lot of options if anybody is interested and we'll definitely uh, add links to uh, you know social media handles so for anybody who's interested can definitely sign up and uh, perhaps we can also try and uh, as a part of the podcast episode we can do a giveaway for a uh, few listeners perhaps uh, now before we start wrapping up the episode uh, you know so one thing we definitely can't miss out is the food of hyderabad obviously you touched upon the dosas which is fairly uh, new uh, piece of it but uh, biryani and uh, irani <laughs> chai right, right. Uh, is obviously traditionally what is associated to hyderabad do you want to touch upon that where one should yes. go <laughs> yeah so the thing is uh, if you're in hyderabad so you know it's a subjective uh, people generally run to the old city for to shada and naya right okay if you like it it's not personally where i would go uh-huh. naya is still nice for breakfast you have like khima roti bhaji urda bheja and they have a whole bunch of options which most people love and i'm sure a lot of people know this from hyderabad what you get in restaurant is not exactly hyderabadi biryani because hyderabadi biryani is a lot milder the it tastes very it's different and it mostly is something you get only at homes and at muslim weddings or at weddings because depending on which cook you hire good biryani sell uh, my favorites are grand hotel grand is the oldest irani cafe also uh, slash restaurant built in 1935 uh, nearby you have cafe bahar which is also another irani restaurant it's it, 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 not been there in a while at least i remember it being good Then you have this place called Biryani Wala and Port Banjara. This is actually very good. I would personally recommend it also to people. Mm-hmm. So now Hyderabad House is back. It's a very nostalgic thing for a lot of Hyderabadis. Where what it used to be one of the few places that would sell halim, uh, marag marag is basically uh, uh, it's like a stew. I guess it's a it's a rich soup mm-hmm. which is it, it, it essentially has pieces of like very specific parts of mutton which are attached. It, it has the it has it has parts it, it is made with parts of the parts of mutton which are attached to the bone so that it, it's softer then you have also let me see bawachi is also supposed to be good last i remember it was good but i have not been there again in a very long time um, funnily i end up going to grand most of the time because it is my personal favorite so i, I do have a bias there okay. uh, incidentally grand hotels owner also they also run a, a chain of restaurant called mehfil there is one Uh, at one of the mehfil chains at shake pet has very good biryani it's also my personal favorite mostly and uh, in the old city there's a place called now it just opened recently called khan mia uh, they do a very decent uh, biryani as well and they also have some other interesting things which people can check out if they're interested fanood is also fanood and khan mia run by the same person but fa- but fanood is also pretty good like fanood f a n w o z uh, it's one of the few places in hyderabad which actually sells proper hyderabadi food you know like like uh, marag uh, kya bolte khima lukhmi and stuff so if you want to try all those things i would highly recommend that as well but aside from that i guess i would say paradise is still paradise and alpha hotel are two of my favorite places even today for breakfast for like a proper khima roti breakfast for chai i love the chai at alpha hotel irani chai Alpha Hotel, Grand Garden Cafe. Yeah, I guess these are my three favorites for chai. Yeah, tell us how this uh, Irani chai is different from the regular chai. Uh, I mean, here we primarily get like more Sulaimani, I guess, in Bangalore. Uh, but yeah, tell us a little bit about the Irani chai as well. How it's different. So Sulaimani is basically black tea, and I believe that has more. It's more of a more of an Arab thing mm-hmm. because if you look, because that's what Kerala. has culturally speaking because kerala muslims are more closely linked to the arab world sure. than let's say the other you know, persia in that sense mm-hmm. the iranians who came here see the thing is when the iranians who came here didn't exactly come as rich people these are iranians who came roughly 100 years ago and they pretty much came for migration purposes mm-hmm. uh, like you know how indians they go to the gulf or the middle east to make something of their lives right mm-hmm. pretty much the same thing uh, hyderabad was easier urdu speaking place a lot of people knew persian also i had about 100 years ago mm-hmm. it's like many cases one one person or three or five person would run one cafe together and then you would have like a dozen or like half a dozen Iran- iranians would come down and then who would work at the cafe and then they would slowly branch out and start new cafes on their own 
that's how Irani Cafe has basically started. And the, the thing is, the chai is different because the, the black tea, the decoction and the milk are basically boiled for hours and hours together. Mm. And that's what makes it very different. Mm. So, you know, it's very different if, if you would just mix in the tea, so the, the tea leaves, the water and the milk for like 15 minutes and if you make your chai as against this particular thing, but it, it is a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a lot tastier in that sense. You, you can actually feel the flavor of the tea even though you add milk because of course tea people who are very puritanical about tea say that you should not add milk and tea should be only had with hot water mm-hmm. of course i disagree with that but anyway uh, that's what makes the tea different there were different there are different variations of it depending on how what kind of tea leaves that people tea that people use or how much tea option they put and things like that but it, it, it's a it's a very distinctive chai flavor that you get and i don't and i think even cities like delhi don't actually have uh, a good chai culture in that sense. So I think Hyderabad's, Hyderabad's chai culture is pretty equ- equivalent to what is the Sulaimani chai culture back in Kerala. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no fair. And uh, where do you recommend you say one tries out uh, Irani chai? So if somebody wants to go sit somewhere and have chai, I would always say Grand Hotel is a good option. Uh, Garden Cafe. Garden is now, they have, they have to reconstruct the bakery again. So I don't know how long that will take. Paradise is also not a bad option, to be fairly honest. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, Grand Hotel Paradise, Cafe Bahar is good. Sarvi Hotel at Banjara Hills is also a decent place. In the old city, Nimra Cafe has become very famous, but Nimra is not exactly what I would say is the original Irani chai in that sense. Mm-hmm. Because a lot of places now have started to add a bit of condensed milk mm-hmm. to the chai to make it a little tastier. Mm-hmm. So that kind of loses the essence of what Irani chai is supposed to be. So, Grand, Cafe Bahar, Grand, uh, Alpha, Alpha Hotel is my favorite, yeah, actually Alpha Hotel, Garden, these places still keep it real in that sense. Okay, yeah, definitely something to try out. And, uh, while we close this off, uh, also give us a little bit of a sense of uh, Dakhni or the Urdu, that's also very, um, I think, peculiar to this part of the country, right? Uh, I know in Bangalore we speak very similar um, Urdu as well. So it's, 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 a, it's, it's a different, no, Bangalore also what people speak is Dakhni only, it's just a different variation of Dakhni. Uh-huh. So think it's a very, it's a very long and complicated answer. <laughs> but to put it simply, uh, Urdu is actually a very recent language, it's not a very old language. This has come up in the 1600s only under Shah Jahan's time. Uh-huh. So, and before Urdu you have Dakhni that is what is spoken in Hyderabad, Bangalore and other places. In, the, in South India, this goes, this goes back to the 14th century, but both Dakhni, Dakhni for those, just to put it simply, is a mix of Persian with Hindustani, with Kannada, Marathi and Telugu. Mm. Uh, Urdu is a direct mix between Persian and Hindi, or, or maybe not necessarily, I mean, I guess the dialects of North India in that sense. Yeah. Whatever. Because the word Urdu actually means army camp in Turkish. Mm-hmm. Okay. Cool. It is it's, it's, because the thing is Persian was like this high level language of the nobility of the elite. That is why all of the documents pretty much are in Persian and not in Urdu. And not not until the eighteen hundreds. Or at least not until the seventeen hundreds. Maybe I could be wrong about that, I'm not sure. But if you look at the evolution, you had both Hindu Hindi uh, the, the Rakhni and Urdu that go back to the LV in the fourteenth century. And the Helvi comes down to the Deccan in Maharashtra is when you have it mixing with Marathi and then with Kannada, Marathi and Telugu. So the Hel- the, in that sense, Dakhni comes first in the 15, 1460 with something called Kadamrao. Kadamrao is the first uh, evidence of Dakhni that we have. Mm. So Dakhni continued to evolve until the late 1600s. Hyderabad, Hyderabad's destruction basically ended Dakhni literature. But after the destruction of Hyderabad, poets went down even south to Tamil Nadu. And the tradition of Dakhni continued there for nearly one century. But it was because of the Mughals who finally came mm-hmm. and because Urdu was adopted eventually by the Mughals and later by the Nizams, Urdu kind of became like this official language. But Dakhni continued to survive as a spoken language. That's why in Bangalore and Hyder- Hyderabad, other parts of the South India where we speak in Dakhni, we, like, we read and write in Urdu. Right. It's a very weird thing. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Because you can't kill language so easily. So a lot of people don't realize this because this is as much as, as Urdu is being targeted these days politically. Urdu in a way is what was superimposed upon Dakhni speakers. Sure. And though the base was the same, there is a very distinctive difference in the sense that Dakhni is more Dravidian and is more linked to South Indian languages in the way it is spoken and the way it's structured. It, it is structured. That's what I can say. 
Interesting. <laughs> uh, but yeah, it's just uh, very fine and very nuanced. I think it's uh, there's like little differences, but we uh, definitely do use very common like uh, words like uh, manje, nako, kaiko. <laughs> so manje is not actually used here. It's not? But, okay. Uh, no, so manje is used in like I said, it's used in Tamil Nadu. It's used in Andhra Pradesh. Right. But but like the things like kaiko, nako, how these are all from Marathi, right? So, right, right. Yeah, that's true. Exactly, right. So people don't actually get this. So and you know, even if I tell someone in Hyderabad that you know what you're speaking is actually it has parts of Marathi. So <laughs> because we, when we talk about all of this, we tend to unnecessarily glorify Urdu. Urdu is just another Indian language, which is which is spoken by a lot of people even today. <laughs> no, for, I think in uh, simple, very layman or layperson terms, uh, if somebody has heard to, uh, Danish said does a lot of these uh, very funny skits. He used to do these on radio at least a while ago, right? Azhar and all of those. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So in fact, you know, every time Danish would say something in called Urdu, me and I, I have a couple of friends, all of uh-huh. us would very uh, favorably, favorably share it. Uh-huh. on our stories and we would say call it Dakni and we would tag him so I realized that him and Rida someone named Rida, Rida, Rida Tarana and one more woman what's her name Zoha son of Shim from Chennai mm. I have realized that now these guys have started using the word Dakni Urdu at least mm-hmm. so I think in that sense some kind of activism or at least some kind of awareness has, has been created at least through my work and through others Definitely. And also for me, at least personally, one of the introduction to the Hyderabadi way of speaking was through this movie that came out, uh, I think it's been a few years now, called The Angres. The Angres. <laughs> oh, yeah. It's actually, I, I don't like it much because it's actually a very sad portrayal of Hyderabad. <laughs> uh, so I, w- I would honestly say there are hundred, there, like for example, there are Sham Benegal's movies. If mm-hmm. you know who Sham Benegal is, yeah. who's from, he's, a, he's a proper Hyderabadi from Secunderabad. Uh, there are old movies, for example, there was a movie called Ankur. Right. If anybody has wants to watch Ankur is a movie that includes properly spoken Dakni and it goes over the whole landlord uh, Jagirdar situation. So it, it's a very socially powerful movie. So if you want to listen to proper Dakni, go watch Ankur. Yeah. Now, Angres was uh, definitely like over the top type of a portrayal, but it definitely does, did open up to a lot of people, right? Who, yeah, of course, of course, of course. I, I won't disagree. So the interesting part is. And not the Angres, but there's another movie. Uh, so that character, what is Salim Peku? Salim so Peku, Ismail Bhai. Ismail Bhai. <laughs> so if so, there's so this Ismail Bhai comes in other. Uh, he comes in other movies. Like there are a whole bunch of movies that were made after the Angres right. on similar lines. Uh-huh. In those movies, when they show a couple of characters, those characters like people who work in the lower strata of society. Mm. The, they have got Dakni spot on in that. Mm. There's, recently, there's a movie called Bolo How that was released uh, last year. It's, it's, I wouldn't say it's a masterpiece, but then, you know, that movie actually goes into the lives of ordinary people, of these workers who used to work for these Nawabs and what happens to these Nawabs after the annexation to high, off to India, right? When all of these Nawabs basically become poor, mm. they don't have money, but they have these big, big houses and they need to take care of those houses. Okay. It's a, it's, it's. I won't say it's a great masterpiece, but it will give. It's, it's a move in the right direction for movies on Hyderabad and Deccan. There's one more movie also called Mandi by uh, Sham Benagal. I think that's also made in Dakni. It's a movie set in Hyderabad again. So if it's, you know, it has a whole bunch of old actors like Shabana Azmi, Smita Patel, Nasiruddin Shah, hmm. Amrish Puri. So if anyone wants to go for that, go for that. Okay, yeah, definitely some uh, good recommendations to actually get the more authentic versions of this, I think. But yeah, Angres is like slapstick and over the top type of thing. Yeah, yeah of course. Just of for course, getting some yeah. time. Uh, but yeah, thanks so much, Yunus. I think it was a great uh, introduction to uh, Hyderabad, the old city part of Hyderabad as well. Not just the monuments and the history, but you touched upon a lot of interesting things, right from the stories to food and now a uh, little bit of an uh, overview of Dakhni and uh, some interesting movies as well. So thank you so much. It was uh, a pleasure and an honor for us to have you on the platform. Thank you so much for having me. It was my pleasure talking to you. It was great. Uh, actually, I always love talking about these things. So thank you so much again. Thank you, Yunus. That was yet another great episode on the Musafir Stories. Make sure to show us some love by sharing the podcast with your friends and family. We are on Instagram and Twitter at Musafir Stories. If you like this podcast, don't forget to check out other interesting podcasts on the IVM network. You can listen to us on the IVM podcast app or the website. 
follow us on our social media. We are at IVM Podcast on Twitter and Instagram. Hey everybody, it's been another great week on the IVM Podcast Network. On Advertising is Dead, Varun is in conversation with Vedant Lamba, sneakerhead and founder of the Main Street Marketplace. Vedant shares how his vlogging routine led to the creation of his sneaker company. On Shunya 1, Sheila Ditya and I are joined by Tarun Chavra, founder of Neemans. We talked to him about how he started the shoe company and built a value-driven brand. On Big Talk About Tiny Humans, Devi Shobha and Meghna share a four-step guideline for talking to children about death. On Say No to Drama, Chetna drops some truth bombs about the happily ever after of life post the wedding. And on Hans Vani, hear the story of Usbir Me Wo Kaun Tha. It details the tragic story of the laborers who had to migrate their villages on foot during the pandemic in 2020. Do follow us on social media. We're IVM Podcast on Twitter, Facebook.